Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, both everyone in Runan Lecture Hall here and everyone attending uh, online. I'm Stefan Bengtsson and I'm the president of Chalmers. Uh, it's my pleasure, of course, to welcome you here to Chalmers. It's also my pleasure, together with my uh, colleague, Professor Eva Wieberg, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Gothenburg, to welcome you to this uh, Nobel Prize Laureate Lecture. And in particular, of course, welcome to uh, Professor George Schmoot, uh, which will be the lecturer of today. Uh, this is uh, part of the Nobel Week Dialogue. The, the, it's, the, the seminar is jointly hosted by University of Gothenburg and Chalmers, and of course in collaboration with the Nobel Prize Outreach Organization. It follows a tradition uh, here in Gothenburg where we try to jointly, from our two universities, invite Nobel laureates to visit our university and to give seminars and lectures. Uh, so with that, again, Welcome everyone, and I will hand over now to Adam to introduce the speaker of today and what will happen here. <laughs> Please, Adam. Thank you very much indeed, Stefan. And uh, let me add my welcome to you all, to the online audience, and also those of you who brave the cold to be here. It's really lovely to see you, uh, physical audience. Welcome. And welcome to George, George Smoot. Talking to us from Paris, um, very good to have you with us. Thank you very much for taking the time. As Stefan mentions, this is a tradition. You have a tradition of having laureates generally, but then we also have a particular tradition of having a laureate meet an audience at GU and Chalmers the day before our Nobel uh, Week Dialogue, which happens every year on the 9th of December. So every year on the 8th of December, we have this lecture. And uh, this year, I'm very pleased to say it's George Smoot. He received the Nobel Prize in Physics, as I'm sure you know, for his work uh, mapping the cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, he has an absolutely marvelous mind, uh, which travels all over the universe, really, and it's nice to see where it lands. And today it's landing on the future of sta space travel, and I think it's going to be a really marvelous lecture. At the end of the lecture, we have the chance for those of you who are here to ask questions. And um, we have two microphones, and I would really encourage you to use that opportunity. So George will talk for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have, hopefully, around about 20 minutes for Q&A. Uh, one um, last thing to say is that we do many things from Nobel Prize Outreach, which is the organization I represent. And um, I think of all the things we do, the most important thing is to bring Nobel laureates into contact with the next generation especially the next generation of scientists, uh, you here. And so it's just really nice to be able to do this every year. So thank you for being here. George, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Adam. Thank uh, Chalmers and Gothenburg for inviting me. Uh, it's a long time coming. But uh, I thought today I would talk about the future of space travel. And you'll see underneath there, I have a spoiler, space tourism. Today actually is another red letter day if I get a chance to put that in. But I'm also bringing it up because I think a lot of the guys are going to be engineers and economy majors. And in my estimation, uh, the space business, the near Earth orbit and related area of space business, is going to become the fourth largest, fourth or fifth largest new business. And it's an opportunity for uh, young people to get in new careers in an exciting area. But let's get into what's going on, and then uh, you'll you'll get a hint of what I'm what I'm uh, sort of gesturing at. Okay, it's actually been 60 years since the first astronauts orbited the Earth. Right, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin was the first person in space, and that was on April 12, 1961. So it's a little over 20 years. About a month later, Alan Shepard Jr. became the first American in space. Uh, aboard a, a, a U.S. rocket. And uh, after that, things developed for quite a ways, and humans traveled to the moon nine times between 1968 and 1972 as part of the United States Apollo program. And humans have had a continuous presence in space for more than 20 years, almost 21 years. And uh, But as of this year, humans have not traveled beyond low Earth orbit since the Apollo 17 lunar mission 
in December 1972. And uh, so it's a long time between the visits to the moon starting in 69 and ending in 72. And right now that may be beginning to change. So currently there are only three countries with public commercial space flight, uh, you know, per public or commercial space flight uh, capable programs. There are the United States, Russia, and China, and two of them are being quite active these days. But I wanted to show you an old movie, uh, which is a movie of the Wright brothers' first flight in 1903. And it was, the whole thing only took a few minutes. Illustrates a bunch of things. But they mastered some engineering aspects and embedded some things in order to make control their land flight possible. You'll see they had a well trained crew. Talking about how the fault went. The crew comes out, lifts the aircraft up, and ready to take it back to the hangars. It's protected. Pretty amazing. They filmed it and they had judges and they had all the things to go together. Now it took a long time to get from there to where there was commercial aviation. It took a whole decade before from the flight, from the Wright Brothers flight, till there was actually a scheduled flight. And the first passenger airline flew from Petersburg to Tampa, St. Petersburg to Tampa, it was an airboat line that is, it's took off from on the water and landed on the water. And it basically flew across the big bay and they didn't start until 1914. And they only lasted for three months and they went out of business. However, that started things and they got to be a number of early commercial airlines, including Pan Am, which was founded in 1927. And I actually managed to fly on Pan and I'll talk about one before. Western Air Express and Ford Air Transport Service. None of these are in business anymore, but there are many other airlines in business. Pan Am kept growing and satisfying the customer. And because of that, they ordered new planes. They, they got a new generation of planes. Once they had enough confidence in it, they inaugurated the world's trans, first transatlantic passenger service in 1939. So first between New York and Marseille, second between New York and Southampton, uh, New England, uh, England. And people paid $375 for a one-way trip. It's actually cheaper than that now, even though there's been a lot of inflation. And so it's very much cheaper than that. And uh, that really was a big change. I actually had flown Pan Am put between the United States and Italy, uh, but also many other places. But by the end of the 1950s, the American Airlines were really bringing a new level of speed and comfort and efficiency to the traveling public. And that caused more and more people to fly. Traveling, flying became commonplace. Jet aircraft uh, began to replace just an airlines and the air travel experience that we have today is what we see. So in the background there are a bunch of green lines. Those show the regularly scheduled airline flights. You'll notice there's a big set of nodes coming out of Europe, out of North America and on the East coast of Asia and more limited down to the Southern hemisphere, but it's quite a huge industry now and quite a, a regular thing. And it's very common for people to fly in it, at least before the pandemic, almost everybody flew. I flew almost every week. And so it's just a standard commercial kind of thing. When's that gonna happen in space? Well, the answer is, it's starting to happen. Okay, so here's a picture of the Virgin Galactic, the first one, when Bezos announced that Amazon uh, Blue Sky was gonna fly uh, Virgin Galactic rushed to have their first to be the first tourist in space and it's a double airplane with a rocket that hangs down below it so you can see the double airplane three the two, rocket is dropped one, release, release, release. it's ignited fire, and fire. it jets up into space there's a difference the quality of the cameras that we have nowadays and the number of cameras we have nowadays much better than the Wright brothers 
equipment. This essentially has standard aircraft for the first, you know, leg, and then the second stage, which is a rocket with very nice shiny fins and good cameras and good tracing. And you can see it go into space and burn out. Good job, CJ Mack. We showed test points off and Bravo and then complete. You're going to space. Takes a parabolic orbit up into Again. space, and they get to be weightless, weightless during all this. And then they're readjusting because they have some really interesting technological innovations to make sure that return is done very well. And you will notice the Earth is round, at least it's curved. And you'll also see the atmosphere is very thin. Show you yeah, the decrease in pitch. That was a great and here are the pictures from inside as the thing reorients itself from the Southeast Southern fully deployed, point totally complete. The, the, greatest distance from the Earth and they get ready to start falling so back cool. out. Yep. There's the Sea of uh, Cortez over there. Uh, the I can see the Baja on. Peninsula, Dave. Right? There's Apogee. And there's the top. Silence of space. It's dark on yeah. space because there's no atmosphere to scatter it. Amazing colors. Resetting entry trim. Happy. And it comes back down, and there's cameras to all it back down. The people on the ground to watch and applaud. And it comes back down and lands. And meantime, the airplane can pick it up. It's going to come back down and land. So the big, the big point here is to keep costs down and keep it reliable, they've made it reusable. And things come up, they come back down, they're reused. And they have a chase plane to make sure it's okay. That's fantastic. Right. So we had something like this before, more than 20 years before, right? The space, the space shuttle orbiter, it didn't just go up for those few minutes, that whole flight was over in less than 10 minutes. So it was like the Wright brothers, it was very short. But here, the space shuttle typically would go up for a number of days. This particular one was the last mission of this one. It was up for 13 days. Uh, it, uh, it flew around the Earth in orbit for quite a long time. And then it deorbited and came back and landed uh, on, a, on a runway like an airplane and uh, was in principle reusable again. And it was gone for nearly 13 days, and that was in 2008. So what's the big deal? You know, why did it take from 2008 to 2021 before tourists get to go up? Well, there were a few tourists that got to go to the space station, but they went on the Soyuz, and we'll talk about that briefly later. Okay, so here's, here's the very first one of tourists going back into space in the modern age. And it carried Richard Branson, who is a billionaire and founders of the of the Virgin Airlines and several other things. And they took off from their spaceport in, near, in New Mexico. And uh, they also planned to launch three Italian researchers to the edge of space. And they were going to do it in a few weeks. However, they actually wandered off course and the Federal Aviation Commission is reviewing it before they approve of that next thing. Because you can't just go up and back down. You got to worry about airplanes and other things like that. Okay, but it looks cool. I mean, who, would want, who wouldn't want to fly on this? It looks kind of interesting and exciting. And the question is, did they get to space or not? Is space no air? The answer is space is not quite no air. It just gets thinner and thinner. This little green thing in the middle on the right is the part of the atmosphere which is habitable for human beings. And it's almost as high as Mount Everest or some of the other things you know. It's got Florida and Manhattan on there for scale, so you know what's going on. Mariana's Trench. It's, it's, it's thick, it's kilometers, but it isn't hundreds of thousands of kilometers. It's very thin layer on the Earth. And Virgin uh, Galactic Space Flight went up to 98 kilometers. Blue Origin, which I'll show you next, went up to 100 kilometers. And then the one I'll show you after that actually goes to orbit. Okay, so here's Blue Origin, which is run by Jeff Bezos from Amazon and his crew. And Jeff Bezos went as a tourist one of the billionaire tourists on the first uh, rides. So here is the, the rocket 
It's the first stage of a, of a bigger rocket Two, system. One. And it looks like you know, what you're used to in rocket launches. It's not an aircraft starting up and then things sticking out. It's, it's going up. There's plenty of cameras. You get pictures of it going up. You get a drone picture of it going past. You get telescopes with cameras on them watching it. And you get cameras from on board. And they count down and they shot up. They went up. It's a little hazy that day, unfortunately. But you can see the rocket going up. As it clears, it keeps going on up. And eventually it reaches the point to where it separates. And the capsule goes on up. Uh, and the rocket comes back down and lands uh, vertically the way it took off. So you just see it going away. And you just see these dots. It's kind of boring. You know, and we're just unfortunately, it's in English units. It goes up, the and then here's the rocket the coming back down. The softer the landing, the quicker you can turn and it comes back down and shocks everybody because it breaks the sound barrier. But it comes back down, and it lands on the launch pad. And it's ready for minor refurbishment. You put move fuel in and you can go and, and do it again, right? and fly it again. So the reusability turns out to be a key factor. And that's what one of the things that engineers and the commercial programs bring. Meantime, <coughs> the rocket has gone up and it comes back down. I thought I, <coughs> I had to cut it out, try and keep to my time. So this is not the only thing, the future of space tourism, there's a lot of projects that are going on. Boeing has some, they had some technical problems, so things were delayed until next year. SpaceX and Axiom Space, they want to start launching tourists to International Space Station on commercial spacecraft. It's beginning as early as this year, but certainly by early next year and so forth. So the development of tourism is going to result in steadily decreasing cost of space travel because as engineers design, but they also have a learning curve, the more you produce with something, the more you can engineer it and the better you can make it and the less expensively you can make it. And you have or you build up uh, great capabilities. So eventually space travel is gonna be routine and the market forces are gonna provide for the demand and the technology that make it a, a space industry, a major economic force. And there's even things like a satellite reviewing startup company that, uh, so Orbit Fab has developed a system to attach refueling vehicles to other spaceships. So they want to see that they can do this. They did a test of their system on the Space Exploration Technologies rocket. And they've got a number of major companies uh, wanting to invest in them so that they can keep refueling satellites to keep on station and working. So that's one of the areas. It turns out there's many areas where the privatization of space is leading to big uh, changes and big things, okay? So the next mission that I wanna talk about, all this happened this year is a big change. So SpaceX had an inspiration for private all civilian orbital mission. And what that meant, there was minimal crew training and there was a huge glass dome instead of the thing that attaches to the space station so they could go out and look at the incredible views, okay? So they went on a, a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. That's the one that takes astronauts to the space station. That was on September 15th of this year. And you could watch the action all live. It was, it was all being carried on, right? And there were four crew members that went on a three-day orbital flight around the Earth. They launched from Launch Complex 39 at NASA Kennedy Space Flight Center in Florida. So it was in partnership through NASA. Uh, NASA was allowing them to use one of the facilities. And they had a three-day journey, and they had to splash down the Atlantic Ocean. And again, there was a billionaire interpreter, and a mission commander, and uh, a science communicator, and uh, physician's assistants. And they were there because they are kind of inspirational. One of them, the one on the right, uh, the, the, the bio operator, she's a cancer survivor from Children's Hospital, and they were raising money from Children's Hospital. So those are the various crew members in their outfit and the capsule behind them. So all four of them managed to be in this tiny capsule. Well, it's not tiny, it's the size of a car or something, but 
that four people had the via there and, and be friends for three days. And uh, then uh, they were able to come back. Okay, so now I want to talk about the even bigger mission, the SpaceX mission, and talk about the sophistication of what goes on. It's a two-stage launch. Uh, you tip in the direction you want to be going. You pick up speed. After you've gotten the main engine, given the most boost that you're expecting to do, it's saved with a certain amount of fuel. You separate, the second stage turns on, and then you start turning as soon as things are clear. You start flipping the first stage over so it's facing backwards. You fire the rockets with some of the, of the fuel you have, slow it down so that it will fall back to the earth, and then you deploy some fins to help stabilize it and slow it down. And then you do an entry burn to slow it down a little bit more. And then you have aerodynamic guidance. And then you do this complicated uh, vertical landing that you saw the Blue Origin do. At the same time that's going on, you have the second stage firing. Then you have the fairings taken off because once you're out of the atmosphere, you don't have to have the protection from the, from the wind and the other forces. And then you do the payload separation and the payload then goes on into orbit. And so here, I will show you this again. Copy, one alpha. Do a pitching down range. So we have a lift off. There's a little bit of period of maximum acoustic and other vibrations. It's being a dangerous time for, for the rocket. T plus 30 seconds. Call-outs indicate nominal. Historic mission flying the Inspiration 4 crew. Uh, Onboard the group, Raven and Dr. Dan. Great deal with the crew yeah. in the council. We're into the throttle down, into the throttle button. Keep the vibration severe. About a minute and a half. Throttling down in preparation for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. You can see the camera looking down at the, and then the flight. Oh, no, at the flame sunny. coming out the back of the first stage. We're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. Copy, We're throttled one back up and one Bravo, the call out from space. That's one of the abort sequences. That is a nominal call. Everything continues to be good. Now, I always look at the flame coming out of the back of the rocket. Okay. And I always say that maybe if they do it and then I like it. This is good. Okay, we have a call that. Oh, yeah. He is chosen. We're beginning to get the turbo pump ready on the second stage engine for ignition. We're passing through 3G's acceleration. Everything continues to look nominal. Major event coming up will be main engine cutoff, followed by stage the separation, looking at the second stage engine nozzle, the stage and then ignition right of the second stage. Stage separation confirmed. Engine. That has already on the left, separated from the second stage the and is making its way back to Earth. The, first the velocity on the first down. stage SpaceX trajectory nominal. is being tracked on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. I'm just going to say, so far, everything looking great for the Inspiration 4 crew, at once. Be, hearing that everything yeah, is proceeding the nominally hand, there with the second stage, the which is what you see on the right-hand right side. The second stage and the astronauts. The impact to throttle down and cut off an event called second engine cutoff, and then we'll wait for the confirmation of, of good orbit. At the same time, the first stage uh, will be uh, beginning its landing burn. And here we have the MVAC. We just saw that it um, and shut the off its engine. The first stage is down. It's going to go far. The second stage is coming up. And we're going to go to the next stage. All right, good news there. The nominal orbit insertion. That's amazing news for our inspiration for crew. Okay, and that's the first stage. Landing on the bar. They have automated barges, so there's no humans on it. The barge is out there going around, and the first stage comes and it lands, and it lands on those 
you know, feet that are folded out, plus they're the fins that are folded in. And it's impressive. All you gotta do is tune it up, maybe get a nice coat of paint, fill it with fuel, and you can use it again. Okay, so that orbit was 575 kilometers. That was the highest that any humans have been since Apollo. If you look on this chart on the left, you see the International Space Station is at 408 kilometers. That's where most humans have been. And then there is the Hubble Space Telescope, which occasionally they've visited to do repairs, 540 kilometers. And this is then another 35 kilometers high in that. And there you can see the Earth is actually quite round. You, you subtended angle is about 45 degrees in all directions. Okay, and there's the picture looking out the dome. You can see the round Earth below it. The fish island makes it look even rounder than it is. But, but you look carefully to see the edge of the atmosphere. It's barely, you know, you barely can make it out. All right, so let me talk about the direction things are going. And I call this the meteoric rise of satellites in orbit. That is, in 1957 was the very first satellite put in orbit, that's Sputnik. And in 2020, we had more than 6,000 satellites in orbit. And it's gonna be driven much higher than that because it's all being driven by commercial activity. Okay, And one of these things that having done this over and over again, when I first started doing stuff in space on the shuttle, it cost 100,000 US dollars to launch, a, I think a kilogram into orbit. On the most recent rockets, it cost under $2,000 a kilogram to put things in orbit. And that's getting to be basically the cost of electricity to bring it up an elevator if you pay commercial or home rates. Okay, the space business has been growing like crazy. Okay, there are three companies that now have more satellites in orbit than Russia does. Starlink, when the start was made, it had 1,000. It's now almost 1,600. They've been launching every couple of weeks, 50, 55, 60 satellites. Planet Labs then had 110. OneWeb had 176. These are companies that are putting things into space, large numbers of things. Starlink will have 12,000 satellites up because they're gonna make money from it. They're gonna sell internet that you can get from anywhere, anytime, anywhere you are in the world. So in 2019, there were 2000 high tech things in orbit that were working or almost working. And today there are more than 6,000. By 2030, we estimate there'll be about 50,000. So it's a huge growth uh, kind of thing. The rocket launches have gotten cheaper. Satellites have gotten smaller. The first Landsat satellite was bigger than a bus. Now that same kind of satellite is done with something the size of a compact car. And not only have we miniaturized things and got market capability for technical reasons, the data analysis software has become a lot more advanced. So then I have a picture in the lower right of what it costs for a launch uh, for the various things. And you can see the prices come down, but in fact, the Falcon X can launch lifting the space as much as any other rocket can. Okay, so, and then another thing happened not so long after this, which surprised me, uh, rocket builder Astra put its first satellite in orbit in November, just less than a month ago. And uh, it launched from Kodiak Island, which is the island of the south part of Alaska, off the south coast of Alaska. And uh, it was putting uh, something into a polar orbit, but one that's a sun-synchronous polar orbit, which is what you want for reconnaissance or for earth resources uh, monitoring. But they want to, they get ready to do another launch this time from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Uh, and they're putting up a set of small satellites. They want to put up a lot of small satellites very often. That is, they, they would be happy to do a launch a day. So this is a, an example of how rapid things develop. And they're not even on that list of companies that I showed you that have more satellites in orbit than, than Russia. But their plan is within a few years to have more satellites in orbit than Russia because they're gonna put up many per day, or up to several per day. And now for the economics people, right? A tax haven, that's Luxembourg, is leading the race to privatize space. So Luxembourg has shown that a tiny country can go can go by serving the needs of global capitalism, and now it's had its sights set on outer space. So the crown prince and princess uh, went 
to Seattle in Washington State, United States, and went to the headquarters of an asteroid mining startup called Planetary Resources, which plans to expand the economy in the space. And Luxembourg wants to be one of the countries that's bankrolling it. Why would you want to do that? Well, the answer is there are in near, you know, near Earth's orbit, a number of near Earth object, objects, mostly asteroids, but some other objects that are actually worth quite a lot of money. And so there is one, if you look the third down on my list there, if you can read that, it's called Nurses. This one is going to visit us on Saturday, about noon your time on Saturday. Uh, it will be within 4 million kilometers of the Earth. It won't be this close again until 2060, when it'll get within 2 million kilometers of the Earth. But it has a relatively low velocity difference from the Earth's orbit, and it's very cheap to get to. So it's not so special. It's only worth about 5 billion in precious metals. If you could go and mine it, you know, if I have time, I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. It's not much bigger in linear size than the Eiffel Tower. So you could think about doing this kind of stuff. But if you look down that list, there are some uh, near Earth objects, particularly certain asteroids, that are worth over a trillion dollars. And you can think about developing a, you know, interstellar mining company that's going out there and bringing that stuff back inexpensively and selling it on the market slowly so it's not to disturb the US market too much or the world market too much and make quite a large amount of money mining asteroids. And it's now within technical capabilities or it's within engineering concept of technical capabilities. Okay, so this all kind of started a little bit earlier SpaceX has been smart, it's been patterning with NASA all along, and SpaceX actually launched astronauts to the space station in May 30th, 2020, so more than a year ago. And it took two NASA astronauts to the space station aboard its Crew Dragon spacecraft. There's a lot of stuff in orbit, I just have this little thing to show you. But it's that was the first time. That also marked the time when the Russians started having problems with the space station because they realized they're going to lose the contract for taking things to and from the space station. All right. So now we're going to return to the moon for scientific discovery, for economic benefits, and supposedly for an inspiration of new generation of explorers. So NASA recently announced it's going to return to the moon. It's going to use a spacecraft built in partnership with a privately owned aerospace company. It's, it's actually put contracts out for bid, and they claim to land the first woman on the and the next man on the moon in 2024, they started complaining that Jeff Bezos has sued them because he wants the contract and he's delayed them so they won't be until 2025. But we'll see what happens. In the meantime, China is planning to carry out deep space exploration by sending a man to the moon in 2025. So it's not an accident the US picked 2024. It's a new moon race, right? And Russia sort of realized it was getting bypassed decided to restart another manned lunar program. Europe decided it will partner with NASA. But another piece of interesting news is Japanese billionaire Yusaku Maezawa has a plan for lunar orbital flight that's gonna be open to the public. And he's got contests for births for eight people to go in 2023 aboard a new SpaceX rocket. And if it's successful, the flight will end up encouraging private space flight for a decade. A failure could keep private citizens from running away. The space, the company that he's associated with, Space Adventure, has announced a planned mission called DS Alpha to take two tourists with 100 kilometers, right, of the lunar surface using a Soyuz spacecraft piloted by a professional cosmonaut. The trip takes about a week, and that's the beginning of the scale of what's going on. So lunar tourism may be possible in the future. But the interesting thing happened this morning, about four hours ago. Yusakua Masawa and his professional cosmonaut pilot and his videographer took off from Kazakhstan, from the Russian station in Kazakhstan. And in about an hour, they should be getting to the space station. So it's another billionaire getting another tourist trip up. And uh, this is the, there were a few tourist trips the Russians ran to the space station decades ago before there got to be other issues. So, you know, Tourism, tourism is a hard driver, but these guys are doing it because they think they're going to make a lot of money. 
and they're going to be engineering challenges that are going to be things that they want to do. Okay, how about going to Mars? Well, Mars hasn't got so many amenities. I'm not such a big fan of going to Mars. It's not just the, the movie. So how long is it to Mars? If you use the current technology and you pick the shortest route, that is when the Earth and Mars are lined up best, it takes about seven months. If you pick a random time, it's going to take you more than 13 months. The cruise phase is going to begin soon after you separate from the rocket. That's not so long after launch. And you're going with a speed of about 40,000 kilometers per hour. So it takes seven months to get the you know, 500 million kilometers. And you got some big risks, right? It's not just having to worry about food and other things that's going to get there. There's space radiation, and you don't want to go during solar max because solar flares are a huge risk to human beings. There's also isolation and confinement. There's going to be both physical and emotional issues. And you got to think, are the other people going to be on that thing with you? Or are they going to be stable too? Supplies are an issue, right? Now, if you want to go on to Jupiter, it's only 13 months. Well, that's pretty bad. But Saturn is eight years given the current technology. Yeah, well, what about going to the stars? Well, stars are really, really far away. It takes more than four years to get the nearest star going the speed of light. And with the best current rocket technology, it's like more than 81,000 years or 2,700 human generations. So you better hope that you're gonna live a long time or you're gonna be frozen and woken up at the last minute. You'd also need an incredibly big spaceship for all the supplies you're gonna be needed. Plus you're gonna need an incredible amount of redundancy. So you want cryogenic suspension, you still want a lot of supplies, Got to build it in orbit, and you're going to have an incredible amount of redundancy. It's not going to happen in a long time. All right. Well, what about alternatives to rockets? So it turns out there's a company that just did a test of a rocket free orbital launch. Well, it's not exactly over rocket free, but getting up there before they use a second stage to get the alteration to get into orbit. All right. And so there was long ago a joint US Canada issue known as Project HARP that used a huge space cannon to try and put things in orbit. Spend Launch has a different idea. They make a huge centrifuge. This is the prototype. It's only 33 um, meters in diameter, and it's all in vacuum. And you spin this thing around on a huge centrifuge, and you let go exactly the right moment, and you go shooting up this tube and punch through the vacuum barrier out into the air and you get heated up by, by the, the atmosphere, but you get to a high enough altitude that you can use the tiny rocket uh, up where there's no air and you can do it. They had a test flight in October, uh, towards the end of October, and it got up to the altitude they expected it to, but it needs to be three times bigger, which means 10 times the, the kind of stuff. And it means you're gonna have 10,000 Gs. So remember, you're not gonna go on there as a person, I, I, I know from tests that cockroach can't do more than 300 Gs. Human beings don't do nearly so well. There's a little tiny picture here that shows you what the rocket looks like. It looks like a needle, and inside, there is, the, the fairings drop away, and inside is sort of a conventional-looking rocket that gets will take the small payload up. And you want to put this uh, partly up on a mountain, but not all, all that far up, but on the coast, so you can tilt it to the right angle to ship it to orbit. Okay, well, what about what other technology we have? And at the time, the only thing I knew when, when I started working on this sort of stuff is light sails is the only other kind of thing we could have. So we got to go faster to save the time and resources. And the only quasi developed technology I thought might work for were light sails. And originally, people thought they could use the sun and starlight on these big reflectors and use the radiation pressure to steer the spacecraft around. Now we can think about using very high powered laser. One of my colleagues who got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago now, uh, got it for developing you know, coordinated high power lasers. So the technology for doing that is becoming more, more reasonable. Okay, so, but there's already people been worrying about this. Uh, the Planetary Society has created a spacecraft called Light Sail 2. It's been in space for 30 months and it's got these just giant, it's like aluminized mylar, these very reflective coatings that are spread out in a big square and they orient it such the sunlight reflects off of it and boosts it up in its orbit. And uh, 
it's a self-funded in the sense that the members of the Planetary Society managed to contribute the $7 million and uh, build this thing and operates it. And they share the mission data with NASA, which gave them uh, you know, a piggyback launch. So here's proof that you can put solar sails in orbit and make them work. The Japanese actually uh, had done one for a flight uh, of a spacecraft that they sent in uh, towards the sun where the solar power was much better. And that seemed to work, although I don't have all the details on that. Okay, so the lights, it's a mirror, it's pretty flat. You can see there's beautiful pictures of it in actual orbit. They have a camera on board, right? So the Japanese Ikaro spacecraft, uh, after Icarus who flew too close to the sun, and uh, it, it had a, a module that was going towards Venus and another which was uh, being done by solar sail. Okay, so here's the idea. You got that big square with the shiny material, mirror-like material, and you're gonna focus a really high power laser on it. And that should allow you to transport much more momentum than you can with uh, sunlight. So you've gotta be much more intense than sunlight. Uh, and this means you don't have to carry the fuel up. You can send the energy for propelling it right up by the laser beam. Okay, so I got involved in this thing called Starshot. So the Breakthrough Foundation uh, wanted, uh, Yuri Mulder wanted to have people send small robots to the nearest 50 stars or some fraction of the stars and have them send back information about whether there's stuff there or not before he dies. So the whole time scale is you got to get it sent there in 10 to 20 years and you got to get the data back within a few years by sending it by the speed of light. And so the, the, the concept that we came up with was the nanocraft. That is, you have this big solar cell. In this case, this was a, uh, the solar cells made reflecting by making out of uh, you know, carbon uh, nanotubes, the, the uh, uh, graphene. And uh, you just need a 100 gigawatt laser, which is a little bit beyond what we have now. And you could, accelerate the probes uh, to 20% of the speed of light. And these are called star chips because you can't send more at the time. I thought we could send three grams, but now I think we can only send one gram, but you can make a chip that's only a gram, a chip with a little camera and a little transmitter that can use the, the reflector as a dish for sending the stuff back to the earth. Okay, well, that sounds kind of whatever it is. Uh, it's not exactly. But why do we want to send a thousand of these? Well, when you get up to 20% of the speed of light, you run into a dust grain, you're toast. Okay. <laughs> so you better send a bunch so that some of them make it without being dust grained and so forth. So if you think about interstellar travel and migration, it's really, really far in the future and it's very earliest. Try and scale it up, you know, the Starshot Pro. Simply Siemens, no supplies, water. It takes 22 years. You need a thousand million gigawatts because you got to have it's not one gram, but you got to send a hundred gigawatt person up or some equivalent, right? And if you see how much power it is, that's four thousand times what society has. So you've got to have to do a lot of things to make it work like that. And the way it's done now, you reach your speed within ten minutes because that's uh, that, that's how long you think you can hold everything steady unless you put your your uh, lasers up in orbit and, and control them very carefully, that's still a thousand Gs, 10,000 Gs. And if you drop to 10 Gs for 10,000 minutes, that's seven days or 70 days for one G acceleration. Those, those are really difficult, right? One G acceleration you can handle. The most that any humans who are being tourists these days are exposed to is supposed to be three Gs but they're tested up to 10 Gs but for certain things that can happen. But that's about as much as a human can stand. You can't stand that for seven days. And so you've got to figure out what other solution you're going to do. You're not going to be going to the stars, not for a long time. So you got to fix the earth to last for a long time until we can fix other things. Okay, so there is going to be tourism in space. You can be driving your Tesla around like this guy. He's up there and he's doing it. But you, you, it's only going to be near the Earth. So that's what the situation is. So I'll stop at this point and try and answer questions, even though I had some 
other slides I can show you about other things that are happening. Okay, how can I? Thank you very much indeed, George. Marvelous. Right. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear you until I quit sharing my screen. <laughs> <laughs> it was marvelously on time. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, I tried to. I was rushing it, but yeah, uh, that, I was two minutes over. <laughs> I, I, I've seen you give talks all over the world, and um, uh, that was uh, uh, for you to control it like that is quite a feat. So congratulations. It's, it's <laughs> that special. I see. You're saying I like to overrun? Uh, I, no, you just got I, a lot. You just got a lot going on in your head, and there's a lot to say. I know. Right. So well, thank Steve you. Steve Chu was the one that I always found always ran over, but maybe I'm it's, getting to be. That's true. It's, it's true. <laughs> Steve Chu can also talk. That's quite it's, true. It's not. It's not terrible to be like Steve Chu. He's, I, I agree with I'm you. I'm very impressed by him. Yeah. Be happy to listen for hours and hours and hours. Um, but um, thank you very much indeed. And we, we, we do have these microphones and we do have the possibility to ask questions. And I'd love you to take the opportunity. So please, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, just walk towards the microphone. Don't be shy. Um, uh, I'm going to start, but that doesn't mean I want to continue. I really would like you to come. So please do. Um, George, you know, you, 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 your, your Nobel Prize awarded work was based on you putting a satellite into orbit to make measurements that went up as a part of a NASA program. D does this commercialization of access to space simply help you do things like that work? Is it all good, the reduced costs, the greater activity, the speed of it all? Or are there any downsides for pure research? The answer is, of course, there are downsides. Of course, it's disruptive uh, because people, many of the people who want to go in orbit aren't caring about science. They care about making a profit. And uh, as a scientist, you have very few opportunities. I've been fortunate. I've actually managed to launch satellites for three different agencies. So I have launches for NASA and launches with the European Space Agency and launches in Russia and I, at the new uh, Vostok, uh, not Vostok, um, I'm trying to think of it, it needs east, um, the new facility they built. And we were delayed and delayed for three years for our launch until they finished building the new uh, launch facility. But it's so far north, we had to go into polar orbits and, and so forth. So that was an example where strategic kind of activities overrule scientific activities. Well, first of the latest for that time period. But second of all, they put us in the orbit, which would have been my first choice of orbit, because you go through places where the magnetic fields are coming into the Earth uh, in the direction of the Earth, and therefore bring charged particles in, and then disrupt your detectors. And so forth. Um, but in some ways, it's going to be possible to do many things you couldn't do. But in other ways, the way the space agencies are set up, they have the incentive to be careful and make sure everything works. And the scientists like me, they have the incentive to get as big and best emissions as they can get, given them when they get selected. And that's not to keep it, the cost down, that's to keep the science up. And, and so if you knew you were going to get a launch every year, then you would do, you would build things differently and, and so forth. And so that's a difference between what SpaceX and Astro and so forth are doing. They're going to put up a whole bunch of launches. And so those Starlink satellites that are going up there, they're already in their third or fourth generation of Starlink satellites, with their, which they're putting up and putting more capabilities in and so forth. And they're interested in having them work reliably and having them be cheap and, and, and so forth. So it's a very different kind of a thing. Now, one of the things I've been trying to convince would have my Registries. We're building a new kind of astronomy camera, and we have with our partners in Kazakhstan a, ro a robotic telescope up in the high mountains in the southern part. And, I'm, and I wanted to get the new camera on. I wanted him to measure how much the night sky is getting brighter because of all the satellites going on. If, if we could take data of a couple of years, look near the equatorial plane and look towards the North Pole, we would see my prediction is the night sky is going to be twice as bright as it used to be. It's going to be much harder to do astronomy from the Earth in the future. So, You're going to have to do astronomy from the Earth. So there, there are many things that are going to be negative. There are many things that are going to be positive because 
one of the things that happens is people who are engineers and are putting things out in space, they're looking for new and clever ways to do things. And they'll eventually find cheaper and more capable ways to put this stuff up and we'll be able to do things. The problem is how will the science funding agencies deal with that? How, how will they let us put missions up on other things? Yeah, thank you very much indeed. I, I should mention on questions, you don't have to ask about the future of space travel. You have a Nobel laureate here, so you can ask him just about being a Nobel laureate if you like, and any yeah. tips. So feel free, please come down. And, and I didn't mean it just to be space travel. I meant to make you alert to the fact there's a whole new career out there for engineers that, that uh, it really something to think about. And you don't have to go to space, even though you probably want to. But in fact, most of those jobs are going to be in the ground, but they're going to be doing stuff for things that are utilizing space. Thank you, George. We have a question here. Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for a great talk. And um, I have a question about sort of the ethics of, um, of commercialized spaceflight. And um, to me, it sort of seems that um, it, you, you don't really, it's not really in the same spirit of space travel as, for example, NASA, when you have some like really rich person uh, paying for, for, for going to space. How, so how do we sort of justify this ethically? Um, <laughs> thanks. So, yes, this is a problem about inequality of income and about uh, what, given a limited number of opportunities that you have, how do you actually distribute them? And so the example, the privatization of space is something that I have struggled with because if you actually look at the early treaties said that space was for all of mankind. That has kind of slowly faded in the background. But we have two examples of this. There are two places uh, which we said were for, the, for all of mankind. One of them is Antarctica and one of them is space. Is it easier to go to Antarctica or is it easier to go to space? Well, the answer is clearly easier to go to Antarctica. Why is Antarctica not commercially developed? Well, the answer is you haven't allowed private industry and private ownership. You haven't figured out a system that would allow people to make an investment and get a return on their investment and develop Antarctica. You can say, well, that's not bad. It's cool to have Antarctica as this big park. And the only counter example we had of that was Argentina actually tried to economically develop uh, part of a wedge from going in from the bowl out in the direction where the peninsula sticks out towards, towards Argentina. They tried to develop that and they tried to put a city in and, and have a thousand people and have babies born there and, you know, and schools and so forth. And they helped funding it by the fact that there were tourists wanting to go sing, take cruise ships down the sea, pick in workers and so forth. And then those tour ships could bring so. But the rest of Antarctica basically has remained undeveloped. Fishing people, fishing fleets and stuff come down and fish the waters around that area. But essentially, even though there are many minerals and many other things and places for solar power, many kinds of things in Antarctica, there's almost no development going on. And why is that? Well, I'm not gonna put up a bunch of money and then have the court say, you can't, you gotta share all that money with every citizen in the world. Right. It's, it's uh, too much risk and not enough return. The privatization of space uh, is guaranteeing that some people, unfortunately, it's mostly gonna be billionaires, they're gonna have the resources capable of going space. They're going to develop space and humans are gonna go out in space and do things there. Well, these human agents, because I, one, of the, one of the big areas is robotics and I think of part of the space, the reusable rockets and the low earth orbit kind of stuff. A lot of that's just gonna be robotic systems that are designed and run by engineers on the earth and uh, so forth. But humans are going to be going out and using the low earth orbit to be able to do things on the earth, but also eventually mining the near earth objects and going to other places. Those, that's a good thing. I think it, it would be a good thing to do, but I don't see a simple solution to this. And it's already an issue in that the places where businesses have been encouraged to go ahead and develop or allowed to go ahead and develop and places that don't have the resources, 
are going to get left behind. So in the United States, somehow people made the decision to allow private space companies to go ahead and launch to space and they have to file flight plans with the FAA. They have, they, it's not just, they just do it at random. They don't, can't go in the backyard and do it. But somehow people decided to allow that industry to develop, whereas in other countries that people haven't allowed that to happen. But because of that, space is going to be developed, but it's going to be the near Earth orbit to start with, but that eventually will mean there will be a development of space more. Now the question is, is it going to be equal? Is it going to be equally beneficial to every person? The answer is no. The rich are going to get richer, the poor uh, are going to be left some behind. And they're not going to necessarily get poorer, but they're because everybody will get richer. And and we need some of these things we need because we're using up a lot of the, the elements. And there are some countries that don't want to see mining for other things because they have a, a you know basically a monopoly on certain elements. But in fact, uh, in order to keep prices low and keep the, the, the economy developing, there are some resources you need that it's much cheaper and much more straightforward to get them out of the assets. George, let me but ask. So, so Sorry, George, let me just ask you a very quick follow-up on that question, which is, do you see any hope at all that a system of governance of space that will somehow put a control on this can be developed? Or is it just, is, is it just rushing away from us and whatever gets implemented will always be lagging too far behind? Well, uh, I, I am concerned. It is clear that efforts to make space demilitarized are failing. Right, there is a reason there is a, uh, a space race to the moon uh, between China and the United States, previously between Russia and the United States. And when the Russians dropped out, then the United States quit doing it. And then when the Chinese came along, then the United States picked it back up. Again. There are uh, issues, and um, there's a thing that I had a backup slide about already. The Russians conducted another ASAP test fairly recently, and that was an actual danger to humans going into, into space, but particularly for man-human flight. It threatens very severely the Chinese space station and pretty severely the International Space Station. Uh, and it's going to be those, they took uh, a basically two and a half ton satellite and blew it up into 2000 relevant big pieces plus a bunch of smaller pieces, and they're in a big donut flying around uh, the Earth. And you've got to be careful to plan your launch and your flights to avoid that band of uh, stuff when it's going over, because it's in a crossing orbit. Uh, so it's, it's a little tricky. But if, if it had then split in and hit to another uh, satellite in those orbits, and maybe it will, then instead of being out for five or 10 more years, it's going to be out for 30 years. It, it's it's a problem, and uh, it was a it was a pointed reminder, I believe, that uh, space is important to humans, but it's also strategically important to various countries. And uh, if they can't play, then they can stop other people from playing or something. But it is a it is a a tricky issue, and I think this is a real issue, and it has to do with the fact that the humans as a whole will be better off if they start you know industrializing and using parts of space but the rewards will not come equally to everyone I mean, okay. there will be some people become trillionaires and other people their their standard of living will barely change thank you very much indeed um it's i uh, we've used up our hour and I, thank you very much for your question um, and, uh, I'm sorry, I talk too much. No, no, no. I'm willing to stay and answer a couple more questions if people want. Well, it's a nice idea. I think some people may have to go, but some people may want to stay and talk to you, actually. That's a nice idea that we could just keep the open mic. I don't know if that's technically possible for people. I think it probably is for people to just have a chat with you. But we should close the lecture formally so that those that need to leave can leave. Um, the, um, but um, it's been a huge pleasure listening to you. George, and a very thought-provoking lecture. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all the audience, both digital and present. And I'd like to turn over to 
uh, Eva Wieberg, from, who's vice chancellor at, Uni at Gothenburg University, to give the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dear Professor Smoot, thank you for your thought provoking lecture. We've had a glimpse of what has been done and it's just happening as we speak. We can only start imagining what will be the future of space travel. Who knows? Maybe some of the students sitting in the audience might be working on space travel technology in a not too far future. I would like to say we have much to learn from professors like you and the inspiring lecture makes me even more reassured that science can be explained in an understandable way, even to a linguist like me. Not only can you say the sky is the limit, the stars and remote galaxies might not only be a dream, but actually somehow even more explorable and thus giving us humans important scientific discoveries. And a little parenthesis. By the way, the influence of semantics and expressions of denotation versus connotation in different languages when creating algorithms for AI is really a very good question you made to me before we started the seminar. Take fish species, for instance. In Sweden, herrings are denominated in two different ways. That is sill, south of Stockholm and strömming, north of the capital, roughly. If the translation is not taking care of the combined denomination of the same species, the algorithms might turn out to, for instance, calculate the analysis of herring stock in a deviated way. So language and semantics have to be taken into consideration when working with AI and technology. Just a small example. We can speak more about this in another occasion. So, Thank you so much, Professor Smoot. We look forward to meeting you again. And you're most welcome to come and visit us in Gothenburg. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adam Smith. Uh, and uh, I would very much like to say something to you too, because the Nobel Week Dialogue Organization, the Nobel Media, and the Nobel Foundation, without you, we wouldn't have been here. So on behalf of Stefan Bengtsson, the president of Chalmers and myself, of both universities, Chalmers and the University of Gothenburg, we would like to express our deepest gratitude to you, Professor Smoot, for giving the lecture to the students and staff that participated, either in place or online. And now let me say, have a nice evening and a little bit in advance. Merry Christmas and let us hope for a COVID free 2022. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.